I think we're live. I'm going to take off my mask uh, because I can't sign fast enough um, to keep up. Uh, but I will be doing the live stream for comic news. Uh, we do have a couple of things. First of all, uh, Yogi told me that if I don't tell people to click like, follow, or subscribe, that he's going to slam my nuts in this drawer over here. Smash that like button! It's a very sharp drawer, so please click like or follow us or subscribe, depending on where you're watching us. Uh, on top of that, uh, what else was I going to say? There was something else we were going to say. Cutoffs. No, we were not Cutoffs. Uh, the, I, I'm sorry, guys. It's just business, and we are super busy on shipment days. But the number of people that call us up the day of and try to get copies of stuff, it just it doesn't fly anymore. We were already swamped. This is already – it takes all day to fill orders. So if you call us on the day of trying to get a book, you're just going to have to wait till the next day and pick it up off the shelf or order or pay for it online. One or the other. We're not going to stop what we're doing on the day of shipment to fill your orders because we just can't do it. Honestly, it's a good thing that we can't do it because it means that we've grown a bit and that the job is, well, uh, there's a lot of orders to fill. Um, if you want to guarantee your copies, please hit us at the FOC, the final order cutoff. That's just the way you can guarantee whatever whatever orders you're going to get. And usually we announce all of them and we list all the books and or we list a link to all the books and we do it on social media. So you got to hit us before that final order cutoff if you want something. Uh, some of you are using some app that tells you like, you know, which issues are going to be like rare and what everyone wants. But that app tells you one week before the book comes out, sometimes the day of the book comes out. And that's that's not we're, we're here to help shepherd you into collecting good things. And when I tell you two months out that you should get your copies of nullified variants ordered ahead of time, go get them ordered because hitting us up the day of for, for these nullified variants is just it's not going to cut it. We've had a lot of people calling us about the last Ronin, which comes out today or tomorrow. Uh, yeah, if you didn't order it, you're probably not getting a copy because we've told people months in advance to get orders in. So we're, we're trying to provide, but the job is just, it's becoming too much by uh, doing things the day of. So you guys got to order in ahead of time. It's just, it's got to happen. <laughs> uh, brutal. Thank you, yeah, Nate. Yogi is very brutal uh, with my nuts to these drawers. Uh, <laughs> um, in the meantime, comics news. What, what other news do we have? Mark Spector. Oh, Mark Spector has been cast. And it's uh, Oscar Isaac, right? He looks crazy enough. Yeah, and I think he's got a, a good enough range that he could carry the role. Because whoever does it has to be able to act out at least four different personas in, in a very believable way. I think he could do it. Uh, and and he, he does kind of look like him, so it's a good yeah. cast, I think. I think it's, it's a good like cast. Crazy. Yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I did get hit up by Fanboy Planet to write an article on Moon Knight at some point because I'm Moon Knight super fan. Ah, but I, I haven't uh, had the time, but we will let you know when, when that, that does come out. Um, exited host mode. Oh, 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 that's Twitch. I, I was in host mode for probably Tyler, I imagine. So, um, But we, we need to get to all the books. Do we have any uh, comic news for this week? Pop culture news in general, other than Moon Knight? Uh, we got a uh, brief hint at uh, Aliens Variants for future comics. Ooh. That's right, Aliens variants. Because Aliens has been bought out by Marvel and will now be in the Marvel Universe, right? Yeah, I don't know so. about the Marvel Universe. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, mm, they brought Conan in, so I imagine they're going to bring Aliens in. They'd be fools not to. Plus, who doesn't want to see Wolverine fight Aliens? We all want to see that. Uh, so, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. But there are Aliens variants coming. So, again, if you're an Aliens super fan, now is the time to get in the orders for the Aliens variants. Please do it. Uh, what else? Anything else? How was your birthday? Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this might make you feel better. Oh, what is this? It's a birthday gift. Oh. What'd you oh. get? What'd you get? I've been ambushed. <laughs> <laughs> Can I rip this? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. This is, oh, this is CGC, is it? 
Joker, Year of the Villain, number one. Wow. Wow. Look at they got me. That's amazing. <laughs> How much did you spend on this? I can't imagine this was cheap. Plotting, <laughs> plotting, plotting. <laughs> Ryan Brown variant cover. Wow. That's dope, dude. Thank you so much. I'd hug you right now, but we can't. <laughs> <laughs> and we gotta stay six feet away. But wow, look what I got for my birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Oh. Okay, I gotta put this down. Uh, <laughs> can you put that down there? Uh okay. Um what else? Let's let's get to let's get to uh the comics this week. And of course, we're gonna get to the probably the biggest, and yes, it is definitely my pick of the week. So we knew it was going to be good because it was both Eastman and Laird on the project. This is Eastman, Laird, Waltz, uh, Escorza, and Delgado. Uh, I didn't realize it was going to be this good. Um, if you were paying attention to any of our discussions about who the last Ronin was going to be, who was the last surviving member of the Ninja Turtles and, and who it was going to be? And I said that it was going to be the one character that could grow the most. And I was right. So, if you paid attention to that, you know who it is. But I will say the way this book is written, I, I mean, it's very old style Eastman and Laird. Uh, they don't, they know there's a mystery and that you kind of want to get to the bottom of it. But they throw in a boatload of hints. And in the boatload of hints fall in the fact that the the brothers who have died are, they're, they're talking as ghosts, advising the current living Ninja Turtle about stuff that's going on. And if you pay attention to their tips and their advice, you can pick up on who it is before you turn to the last page, which it's it's good writing. It's it's Eastman and Laird at their best. You know, it's it really is. And it feels exactly like those old comics, with the exception of the fact that it's color. Uh, it's not black and white like it used to be. It is color. It's very good. And the last man standing is rocking a black headband, which is very appropriate. Uh, the whole issue, I don't want to spoil any more than that. I will say that there are so many callbacks to so many good things and so many good characters and, and things that have occurred. If you remember, for example, uh, a lot of the very early tales of, the, of TMNT, most of those are referenced in this issue in particular. Uh, on top of that... Um, the, there is a memory or a dream that plays out in one scene in this. And if I'm remembering correctly, uh, it didn't happen to that specific character. So it has me questioning as to whether or not that there's truth to who the last Ronin is. And I'm not entirely sure. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But uh, is it good? It's great. It's awesome. It's amazing. The action was perfect. I, I love seeing Eastman and Laird work on something together again. Uh, the writing is good. And granted, I, I think I have not hidden the fact that I think the current TMNT line on the shelves is totally great and worth picking up. But this is like a, a fanboy's dream right here. So it's awesome. Really, really good. It's, it's exactly what I wanted in a TMNT comic. And you should come pick it up for sure. And the art, it's Eastman. It's, it's great. Um, well, it's Eastman with other artists tied in, but it's, it has a very Eastman feel. It's really, really good. Uh, so, yeah, grab it. Get it. A any way you can get it, get it. Uh, will you be able to get it from us? Probably not the first copy. If you, if you really, really rush down here, we have a few copies left, but we do have a second printing on the way. So if you don't get first printing, you will get second through our shop, uh, and that will be here. So, yeah. Next is Red Hood Outlaw, issue number 50. And this is the extra-sized anniversary issue because, quote, 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 the outlaw era ends. So does that mean he's going to give up the, the knockoff Sub-Zero mask and go back to the old hood? Uh, I hope so. I mean, that's, that's the OG look on the cover. But I didn't see it quite happen in this issue, is all I'm going to say. A little bit of a spoiler. Uh, this does tie a lot up or uh, tie a lot of loose ends up is what I mean to say. Um, uh, Jason's been through quite a bit. I mean, quite a bit in the outlaw era. 
And his biggest regret is Duella Dent because he sees a lot of herself in him or in, sees a lot of herself in, yeah, in him. So he's, he's uh, tried to rescue her at times and failed. And this is sort of, well, bringing it around full circle. So it was good. I had a good time. As a Red Hood fan, um, it's, it's nice that they're finally wrapping all, all the loose ends and they do it in one big issue. Uh, still not a fan of the art. I've been pretty vocal about it. But uh, apparently um, my, the art snob in me is, uh, I don't know, not in good standing because Cam says he loves the art of Red Hood and Cam is definitely another Red Hood super fan. So I don't know. We're at odds on this decision. I, I'm not a huge fan of the Red Hood art. Uh, he certainly is. But, uh, you know, Red Hood story is my jam. So, yeah, it's good. It's good. Don't jump in on it. If, if you're not already a Red Hood fan, that ain't the book to do it because that is tying up a ton of stuff and you will be thoroughly confused if you jump in on that. point. Um, next is Legion of Superheroes, issue number 10. First kiss. Well... Love has blossomed for Jonathan Kent, and I I can't couldn't for the life of me find that in this issue. <laughs> Could not at all find that in this issue. This issue actually centers around the Golden Lantern, which is cool. Uh, and maybe I missed the first kiss because I was skimming. Ding dong, we have the side order placed. But uh, there is a lot about the Gold Lantern, which is something I wanted. It's just weird that they did it with the whole first kiss scene. But uh, you do get a lot of the Golden Lantern in this. If you want some backstory on him, he's still a really weird character, I must say. And it's told in the Legion of Superhero style, so you know that they're going to cut between several different heroes all at once as they, they flesh out his story. And that's what happens in here. Uh, it's good. It's good. Just uh, I feel like the cover was almost false advertising. Because didn't they have the first kiss in the last issue? I think they did. They, they totally did. So it's good. The art's great. Uh, the storyline, it's pretty good. Uh, I'm not a huge Legion of Heroes fan, but Bendis, Sook, uh, Von Grabadger, and Belair, uh, it's a pretty good showing. And I would say, actually, you if you want to jump in there, it's probably a pretty good jumping off point. Um, you might be a little confused because the way they tell those books is kind of a weird style. But uh, if you're a Lantern Corps fan, you probably want to know about the Golden Lantern, so just come pick it up. Next is Dark Knight's Death Metal, Rise of the New God. Let's discuss this for a minute. And it's difficult to discuss this without spoiling a little bit. Preface. I'm going to preface that. Uh, the universe that this takes place in is a, D is a DC universe. And, and that DC universe is in a multiverse. And that multiverse is in an omniverse. And someone from the Omniverse shows up to catalog what is going on in the multiverse and might just be a game changer. So what do you get in this issue? You get a lot of good art. You get a climax of the story. And you finally do get the big fight between – I don't even know what we're calling the Batman who laughs in this form because it was Bat-Hatton. And then it – and then it, it now it's like a, a sort of version of Barbados kind of. Uh, looking dark god sort of thing. We already had a bat god, and that was Batman on the Mobius chair, so I don't even know what we call him. But we finally do get to see him fight Perpetua in this issue, which was actually pretty good and hysterical in a lot of ways. So uh, I, I, had a, I had a pretty good time with it. Um, it is the climax for the big, uh, the big Rise of the New God fight, and it, it didn't disappoint in any way. The art was good. The story was good. I had a pretty good time with it. I, I just will say it was kind of strange to introduce uh, a, a new character, at least to me. I don't know if he's been introduced before. But to introduce a new character at the climax of this fight, uh, super interesting. Uh, I, I, I actually finished it and wanted to go back and reread it. So uh, I will say this is a must-buy if you're a DC fan. But... If you're a DC fan, you're already buying all the Dark Knight's death metal. I'm pretty sure of it. We don't have a lot of it on our shelves except for Robin King. We've got some left of those, so come pick them up. But uh, you, you're probably already buying that in droves. Uh, let's discuss this. This is Dan Waters, Steve Beach, and Dave Stewart. And we're talking about Last God, Songs of Lost Children. Now, this is a one-shot. Now, I, I think my big criticism when I read the first issue of Last God was like that it feels like a fairy tale, but one that wasn't quite finished 
And yet we had a lot of people who were super, super into it. So I, I had to go back and, and reread some of the other issues. And then, you know, I've read this issue. And I will say that these tales play out like the grim fairy tales of stuff, like the old dark sinister ones. That's what these feel like. And this one in particular, super fleshed out. Uh, the art was really good. And as far as like fairy tales go, it, it felt proper and dark and sinister and had a good ending so i was not disappointed at all i think if you're a fantasy buff you should have already been on board with this but if you're looking to jump in on some of this stuff this one shot is pretty damn good so i would say don't skip it if you're into fantasy pretty darn good granted i still think the best fantasy on our shelf right now is that critical role book but a second best right now is this last one although i will say the art is for this is probably the best of Art is just top tier. Um, next is Justice League Dark, the last stand against the Upside Down Man. Now, I, I've heard these promises before, Justice League Dark. <laughs> uh, they've never solved this, this Upside Down Man. They've had so many fights with him at this point over, uh, well, 27 issues, and he still really hasn't been resolved. So uh, will we see it resolved in this issue? Maybe. Maybe. I will say that if you know me and you know who one of my favorite characters are that's tied to the Justice League Dark and that, that, that makes the ultimate sacrifice, which was really painful to read in this issue, you'll know who it is. You'll know who it is. Because if you know me, you know who it is. It was painful, but it was good. It was good. And, and he tends to come back, so I'm not too concerned about it, but you get that in this issue. Uh, the art was great. The storyline's really, really good. Uh, these upside down fight man fights are always so intense, I guess. And with magic being warped and twisted, it's just, it, it makes for such good art. So really this Justice League Dark Run is grand. Like you really, really should be reading this. Uh, wow. Such a dope. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, Tom Holland is Nathan Drake. Oh, that's dope. Uh, what's up, guys? Uh, Yogi, what's up? What's up, Alex? How you doing, Alex? Um, next is John Constantine's Hellblazer. And this is Simon Spurrier, Aaron Campbell, Jordi Belair. Not to be confused with Tom Taylor. This is the other stuff that has been running for quite a bit. I think this is issue number 11. And wow, wow, wow. Now, I know a lot of you were, like, falling over each other trying to get the Tom Taylor Constantine. But I will say that in a lot of ways, I really do, as, as good as Tom Taylor is, which is not a knock on that book, but I really do love the current Hellblazer stuff better than that stuff. I'm not sure why. It may, it's just, it's the art is really, really gritty, like chew your teeth grit, which always seems to feel right for Constantine. It's dark. It's sinister. Uh, and, and this book in particular is a statement against, which has always been an underlying thing. It's a statement against, uh, well, the sinister nature of politics in our world. And this one in particular is, is it's very overt in, uh, in that comparison. It's, it's, it's quite, it's brutal and messed up. And at one point, uh, Constantine even sees something that makes him throw up, which is a, a bit shocking knowing Constantine, you know? <laughs> He's dealt with a lot of dark and sinister stuff. So uh, that reason alone is totally worth reading this. But, oh, man, is it twisted. It's good. Any Craven comics coming up? No, no I, I haven't seen Craven the Hunter in too much lately. Not since he uh, fought Spider-Man again for the last time. <laughs> Until the next time. Uh, but this is pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. So uh, the art's great. Um, it, but, again, if you don't like grit, you, you would probably avoid this because this is like – Chew your teeth with the type grit. Uh, so come pick that up. Next is Flash 764, and Flash is taking on Dr. Alchemy. Yeah, Dr. Alchemy, which is pretty much a hokey hero to me. I've never really liked Dr. Do you like Dr. Alchemy? No. Like, yeah. But uh, it, it might lead to something that a lot of people have not seen before. So that was kind of interesting. Um, I, the art was good. The story was, it was okay. Uh, I just, I, if, if, if I really don't identify with the villain or, or generally like the villain or feel like the villain has a lot of flair, 
mm, it's sort of hit or miss with me. And that's how I felt about this issue. I, I don't think that this is, well, I mean, it would probably be a good jumping off point, but I mean, if you're trying to get into Flash, if you aren't already into Flash, mm, maybe skip this issue and go back a few issues. Next is Batman Detective Comics, issue number 1029, and this is Tomasi, Rockefort, and Brown, and mm, mm, mm. Uh, this art really, in a lot of ways, felt like the Red Hood art, which is not my jam, I'm going to say. Uh, but the storyline was actually pretty good. Um, it said, it, oddly enough, it had Batman having to use his tools in ways we don't see him use too often because something went wrong. And I had a good time with that. It was very Indiana Jones and just sort of felt right for Batman. On top of that, we do get Nightwing rolling through. Uh, yes, Alex, our store is open right now. Uh, no, not coming up. We, we don't have any King Conqueror comics coming up anytime soon. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I, it was just, it was a pretty good issue. You, you get a guest appearance of Nightwing and Nightwing really... Did what Nightwing does. You get Batman sort of using his tools a bit differently. Uh, had a good time with it. Just was really on the fence with the art. And I'm saying that as a very devout Batman fan. Uh, it just, it didn't, I don't know, it didn't hit home with me. Um, it was pretty good. Uh, not great. Next is something that was absolutely great. Wonderful. Across the board. And this is Jeff Johns, Jason Fabic, and Brad Anderson. And that is, well, Batman Three Jokers. Now, I will say that I felt like the second book was the weakest, and I was waiting for a good wrap-up to the story, and it was pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not Jeff Jones' best work, but pretty good. I had an all right time with it. Uh, I will say that the end of the book does feel like a punchline, like they set it up for something, and it sort of goes a different direction, uh, which it feels right for the first story about the three jokers. It's just feels sort of spot on. Uh, but yeah, if you've been picking these up, this of course is the Red Hood variant. Uh, I don't have the uh, the Joker one on hand, and we don't have a lot of copies. So if you haven't already pre-ordered these, uh, you might not be getting them. But uh, this one, man, it was all right. It's pretty good. Uh, the wrap up was better but it wasn't as good as the first the first first had just jaw dropping moments this one still was was a good time the action was good the wrap up was good just not great yeah i don't know i don't know uh it's jeff johns so really when jeff johns pulls back the curtain i expect a lot more like the end of doomsday clock for me was amazing like i thought it was the most amazing book ever and that's usually what i expect from jeff johns but i'm kind of an old lantern core fanboy so you know, I, I like the, the house that Jeff Johns built. This is still pretty good. Just not Jeff Johns' best. That's all I'm going to say. He's, he really does set the bar kind of high, though, for Jeff Johns. So really saying pretty good for Jeff Johns is like saying outstanding for anyone else. Yeah, the guy is like running all their like media mobile like stuff for DC right now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, next is, well, issue number 48, Batman Beyond Jurgens. Uh, Pelletier, Ray, Ravmund, and Sotomayor, and we do know that Batman Beyond is coming to an end, so God help us! Booster Gold came into play. You know there's a problem with time, and Booster Gold's going to totally screw something up, if you can see him on the cover. So you see him and Skeets right here, you know what you're getting here. Something's gone wrong with the timeline, and they're going to need Booster Gold to fix it. Well, they're going to need somebody else to help Booster Gold fix it, because that's usually what goes down. Uh, is the issue good? Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, the art is good. Um, not much to complain about, uh, but I'm not the biggest Batman Beyond fanboy. Uh, I, I like it. It's just not my franchise of choice, so I mean, it's, it's sort of hit or miss with me. This issue was great, though. I, I do kind of like seeing Booster Gold drop the ball. I don't know. That's that's pretty much his job, is drop the ball in the DC Universe. That's right? Is there... Like, Pretty much Booster Gold messes up the timelines and Barry Allen messes up the timelines. And yeah. that's pretty much their standard, you know? Uh, Booster's just much worse at it than Barry Allen, which is weird to say. Uh, <laughs> next is issue number 13, Batman Superman. And this is Williamson, Rayner, and Sanchez, the rage of the robotic rogues. And yes, yes, they, they we found out that the moon was covered with uh, robotic villains for Batman last issue. And it wasn't quite resolved. And... It does get resolved in a very Batman and Superman type of way. And I have to say that the way they pulled it off was kind of impressive. 
Uh, as far as like, I, as far as storylines that are written in this Batman Superman line, I've liked most of them. But this one in particular, the way Batman solves the problem, was super intriguing. And it made perfect sense, but it just it felt like it was just harkening back to those old sort of detective st- detective comic stories where Batman solved it in a really sort of wild and just, just, just a, a way that we wouldn't normally expect. I had a great time with it. it honestly, if as far as my DC picks this week... Um, I'm probably going to go with Three Jokers. I still think Three Jokers was the best showing for DC this week. But this is a close second, so don't skip it. Uh, next is Joker War Collateral Damage. This is Sad Face, the giant-sized final issue of Batgirl. And this is Castillo, Lupi, Lupacino, Aneki, Savage, Von Grabager, Gray, Belair, and Moville. And this was, well, it was a touching ending. It's, it's an ending. It wasn't my favorite ending. It wasn't quite something I wanted for Barbara Gordon. Uh, it was it was okay. Um, there wasn't enough action, in my opinion, in the first story, and there was plenty of action in the other stories. And as far as I was concerned, it was all right. But, I, I mean, like, her brother dying a couple issues back and the way that went down was so painful – and it doesn't really feel resolved in this at all. So, yeah, it's an ending, uh, but it's it's only so-so right now. So uh, I will say you should totally uh, – any oh, okay. Um, I, I can't take any more questions right now while I'm trying to do live stream. I'm trying to get through the books so we can finish sorting the books. So I'm going to get to that right now. Um, okay. So a, as far as send-offs are concerned – it felt a little weak in some areas, so it wasn't my favorite. Uh, I will say the cover is astounding. I mean, that cover is brilliant. It's great. Um, but, yeah, uh, so that's the last issue of Batgirl for now. I guess she's being chill, which is so sad. Uh, next is Wong, Cresta, and Rosenberg, and this is Fortune and Fate Power Play. And this is the wrap-up for the Mystical Luck and Eternal Life Rings uh, which said her, which actually Dr. Afro had gotten beaten and lost. Uh, and so, you know, if you know Dr. Afro when she's lost and sort of like tied up or in chains or something, that tends to be where she does her best work and figures her way out of the problems. In a lot of ways, she feels to me like D- like a, a Star Wars version of Batman because uh, <laughs> of how she outwits people and outplays them. And that's what you get in this issue. It is a fine Dr. Afro book. In fact, it is one of the best I've read in a long time. Uh, granted, it is the wrap-up of an arc, so I don't believe you should jump in on this. You should go back a couple issues, but it's pretty darn good. Uh, so that will be on our shows as well. Next is, begrudgingly, from the pages of the Goon, and this centers around the Unholy Bastards versus the Future which it really centers around time traveling and those kids from the Goons comics, which if you know those kids from the Goon comic, they tend to be like, hey, that thing is messing up our town. Let's go beat it up with sticks. And that's pretty much what you're going to get in this issue. It's the kids in time travel and beating things with sticks. and It just fits the characters really well. Uh, So what do you get from this? You get the art of the Goon along with, well, the uh, joking of the Goon by Tom Sknowski, Steve Mannion, uh, Marissa Louise and Scott Brown. The comedy is center stage. So if you like the goon or you like Hillbilly, you will know what you're sort of getting with this. Although I will say that the humor from Hillbilly is not necessarily anything close to the humor from Goon. So yeah. Um, next is Christopher Cantwell, uh, Salvador La Roca, Guru Effects. And we're talking about Dr. Doom. Uh, issue number eight. It was a long time between S7 and 8, wasn't it? When was Doctor Doom uh, number seven? It's just like how long it took for Spider-Man the Abrams one to come out. Right? It felt like it felt like Doomsday Clock. I right? yeah, it was a very very long time. So long, in fact, I'd mostly forgotten what was going on with Doom. Uh, <laughs> he was still dealing with the ant lines, or the world was dealing with the ant line singularity when somebody sort of blew up a black hole on the moon that they were trying to control and it was growing out of hand and everyone had to figure out a way to fix that. That's what they were dealing with. Meanwhile, Doom had lost his, uh, he'd lost Latveria and he had to go to war to regain it. And this issue is 
Well, it's a bunch of people coming to the conclusion that they might be lost inside the ant lion singularity. Uh, on top of just a bunch of wild stories that center around doom and brood and the, 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 the woman who had sort of betrayed him to steal that very, I can't remember her name right now. Um, but it was a pretty good showing. The art for this series is really, really, really good. I mean, stupid good. Like there are times where I just have to stop and kind of stare at the pages. Um, the, uh, it, 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 a lot of times the art just feels like, like almost a call to a uh, immortal Hulk at times. Uh, the story's pretty good. Um, it was a little disjointed at times, and granted, I have to read, like, an entire novel of books every week really sort of quick. And while I am a pretty good speed reader, sometimes I lose stuff in translation. So uh, that's just what I gathered from it. I actually want to stop and go reread this one and catch back up, but it was a pretty, pretty good showing. Uh, I, I will say I have not been disappointed in one single book in this entire Doom run. So uh, that's a really good testament to Cantwell because uh, he's not he's not boring when he writes Doom and and Doom is such a fun character to write I think too. Uh, next is well it's called uh, Giga I think Giga G I G A Pac Pac Nadel La Roche Bidicar. This centers around a world that has well um, it opens with them discussing the Great Book of uh, the Great Book of assembly which centers around well uh they had a war with uh, giant robots and now a lot of them are destroyed and some people are living inside of them yes it feels very what is it xenogears Xeno, xenoblade xenoblade is the one where they were living inside of robots or on top of robots uh yeah it feels very xenoblade um that's not to say it's a bad thing it's just weird and one thing that I do not like in stories, and granted, I know it's an easy way to shoe in some lore, but when somebody is giving a tour about their world, whether it's a museum or a class or something, and that's how they open the book, so they're discussing what has happened in the past, uh, it just feels like such a tropey way to tell stuff. And that's kind of how they open this. But I will say that the story was pretty interesting. Uh, I was I was definitely intrigued by it, and the art was pretty good. I really don't have anything to complain about story or art, that one trope aside. Uh, I do want to give it another issue before I fully tell people to just rush out and buy it. But as far as number ones go, it was pretty good. If you need a new indie in your life and you want to start, you, you like robots and sort of fantasy sort of mix mash, this is pretty good. So, yeah, it'll be on our shelves. Next is Yang, Ruan, Tan, and Cheng, and we're talking about Shang-Chi. Now, the first Shang-Chi, I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, you know what you get with Shang-Chi, you're going to get a martial arts story and a little bit of mysticism and stuff like this. And this issue was awesome. But, I mean, if for nothing else, the fact that he gets cut and bleeds galaxies is what it looks like. It's like bleeding stars, which is really really cool and not something that i knew i wanted i mean granted i don't really know the shang chi ch character all that well but uh i do like this level of mysticism and i do like all the martial arts and it's just a good showing uh he is meeting up with his family in this uh, in the form of a sister and if if you know how it happens with with sort of like clans and fighting and stuff like that you might expect to betrayal you could expect it you probably already do uh, I mean, as far as Kung Fu stories are concerned, this is really, really awesome. So it'll be on our shelves. Can pick it up. Next is Dugan, Zerker, and Tartaglia. And we're talking about Savage Avengers. Now, I have loved this Savage Avengers run. And the last issue saw that most of the Savage Avengers were coming together to decide, again, how to deal with Kulan Goth, who is not a blood god, per se. He's a sorcerer who's kind of become a devoured a bone marrow god i think it is so i they ran out of blood and they switched to bone i guess is what conan's now dealing with but uh it hasn't been resolved and the build-up to it has been awesome uh i i do have to say that of all the characters in the savage avenger run black widow's observation on conan and his behaviors are always so hysterical just over the top and you do get that in this one uh, I laughed out loud several times, which is just 
it, for a story that is this gritty and and brutal, it just it's it's a real testament to Jerry Duggan's ability to just find humor in really dark situations. Uh, I loved it. It was honestly one of my favorites of this week. Not my pick of the week because, well, okay, we already said my pick of the week is probably the TMNT Last Ronin. But uh, as far as Marvel books are concerned, this one is a do not miss. Don't skip it. It was awesome. Really, really good. Uh, next is Department of Truth, issue number two. Now, this is Tinian Simmons and Bidicar. Now we can finally discuss what happened in that first issue. So we found out that the Department of Truth, uh, the main character basically, he goes to a flat earther conference in the first issue. And he's there and he's meeting crazy people and he's sort of kind of like, these people are weird. And then somebody puts him on a plane and they fly him to the edge of the world, thus proving that the flat earth theory is real. And then somebody shoots all of them dead except for the main character and says like, hey, you work for the government, right? Come with me. So they take him to a debriefing room where they debrief him. And it turns out that as long as enough people believe in a conspiracy, that conspiracy becomes real. And that's the problem that the Department of Truth deals with is these conspiracies that become real and how do they handle them? And so he's sort of being debriefed at the time and explain like what, what is going on with this, how we handle this, uh, and, and, and everything's happened. And then the main, it turns out that the guy heading the Department of Truth poaches him and says, oh, you work for the CIA? Mm, now you work for us. And uh, on top of that, it's nice to meet you. My name is Lee Harvey Oswald. So they threw all of that in our laps at the, laps at the end of the last issue. And it was like, Wow! What? Wow! Tinian, Tinian the Fourth has gone above and beyond on this one. Uh, the art, my God, is the art good? I don't know what it is. It's like, it's like watercolors crossed with just strangeness and scribbles at times and static. But for telling a conspiracy story, it works perfectly. And this issue in particular centers around the Satanic Panic, which if you don't know what the satanic panic was it was late 70s early 80s everyone was scared that, that there were all these secret people that were satan worshipers that were messing with our children and stuff like that and it's why people were scared of dungeons and dragons and and pac-man video games and all that weirdness yes. uh <laughs> yeah so it centers around the satanic panic and how many people believed in it and whether or not there was any truth to that because enough people believed in it and so it's really interesting and twisted and messed up. And it tells a lot of conspiracies and at the same time sort of points to how ridiculous our society is today that so many people believe in so many conspiracies. Like they actively make fun of like lizard men conspiracies and uh, I, I don't know, 5G conspiracies and all types of strangeness. All of that gets dumped in the laps of the uh, the main character on this book and it's great it's an amazing ride so far and it's it's really weird because i i noticed there's not a terrible amount of action in this book which generally for me as an action buff i tend to go mm, mm, not enough happened but the narrative and the art is such a wild roller coaster ride that i wasn't bored at all like not one bit so i would say do not skip this book at all. If you're an indie buff, you absolutely need to go out and get this book this week. It's amazing. Uh, next is Rick and Morty Ever After. And, well, if you can't tell from the cover, this is a Rick and Morty fairy tale because that's just what they do. They just decide they're going to tell a fairy tale in D&D &D universe one day, hell the other, and now the fairy tale universe somehow or way. And they're going to flounder into it and flounder out of it because that's what Rick and Morty do. And if you like, if you like the cartoons, you'll probably like this. The art is, well, it's the same as the cartoon. <coughs> I wish I had my drink with me. Can you grab me a ramen out the back? Is that doable? I'm sorry. Am I asking a lot? You want me to just take a break and go get it? I'm sorry, man. Uh, um, but you know what you get with these comics. They're all, they're all just trying to tell a tale, basically do a fish out of water thing with Rick and Morty. Uh, it's okay. I would say if you are not a Rick and Morty super fan, it's probably not your jam to begin with. So, Next is Machio, Bionofantino, and Rosenberg. And we're talking about, about Black Widow's 
Widow Sting. And, well, the storyline's pretty good. The art is all right. That's just kind of my final verdict. It is a one-shot, and, you know, I I had a pretty good time with it. The story went in directions I didn't quite expect. But the whole time, I couldn't figure out why. I was just kind of on the fence about the art. So I I think what, what is happening here is I'm judging this. Uh, against the current Black Widow line, which has been really awesome so far and kind of a cool mystery that I didn't know I wanted in the Marvel Universe. Uh, and this is just sort of a, it's a pretty good one shot. I had a good time with it. Uh, maybe I'm being a little hard on it, but, but it was all right in my opinion. Uh, the action, there was plenty of action. I will say that. There was plenty of action and it was all pretty good. Uh, let me let me just grab a ramen real quick because my throat is going talking so much. Me asking Yogi to run into the back to grab me a wrong I'm sorry, Yogi. Thank you, though. Okay. Next is Aller, Kelly, and Peter. And we're talking about G.I. Joe. And we have been brutal about these G.I. Joe books, I think, recently. Cobra has taken over the world. Uh, or not the world, the United States, and Joe is sort of divided into terrorist cells, and they've got to use their, their their talents to fight back. And this one in particular centers, centers around Tunnel Rat, uh, doing what Tunnel Rat does, which is fighting an insurgency fight after all his brothers get taken out. And uh, it was brutal and fun and awesome and made me really sort of sit back and go, maybe I need to give these G.I. Joe books a second chance because that was really, really good. It was a great showing. So I, I had a good time with it. I love the back of these books that say Obey Cobra. I had a really, really good time with this issue in particular. It was violent, brutal, and fun. And as far as war comics are concerned, I never knew that I wanted G.I. Joe in this dark position where they're just sort of backed into a corner and have to fight back in the most brutal of ways. But it works really well. So, yeah, come pick this up. I would say that's a great jumping off point if you want to get into G.I. Joe right now. Next is Howard Hickman, Laraz, Asrar, and Gracia. And you know if I'm saying these names, I'm talking about something major. And that is the X of Swords stasis. This is part 11 of 22 of the X of Swords. And, well, the Council of Swords has been assembled, and we're already starting to take bets as to who bites the bullet in the, the following uh, storyline, because whoever dies in the battle uh, against Arako uh, in the champion, uh, the, what is it, the con Champions of Swords, Contest of Swords, whoever dies cannot be resurrected in their current form. They will forever be changed. Um, so that means all bets are off the table. Now, we're trying to figure out who is going to die uh, for at least the mutants, uh, the, uh, the Krakoa team. And I think we've deduced that well, Wolverine eventually gets the Phoenix Force in the future, and we've seen how a lot of that plays out, I think, in the last Thor run, So, and and also Infinity Warps, weirdly. So we don't think Wolverine is going to be the one to bite the bullet, uh, but who else is going to die? Like, who could die? Cypher has no sword training whatsoever, and he's one of the guys, so he's probably going to die. And I think that that would make for a rather strange story if nobody can talk to Krakoa. And Krakoa has to get stuff across. And that would that would be pretty wild. And I think that's something Hickman would do. So I'm my money is on Cypher dying, but we're not sure who else is gonna bite the bullet. And a lot of stuff is getting thrown around, so we're trying to figure it out. Uh, maybe Apocalypse finally dies. That would be weird, but I if anyone's gonna kill him, it would be his ex-wife and his kids. <laughs> But uh, the story is great. And more importantly, this story does cover the swordsmen of Arako. And we, we do get the counters and, and what their powers are and what their swords are. So all of that gets explained in this issue. So you can't skip it. But it was really awesome to read. It really is one of Hickman's, uh, you know, you, you know, when you're talking about Hickman, you always say, like, like he's just such this amazing writer. And anything that's got his name on it, I, I tend to not ignore and this issue in particular, I I had a real, real good time with it. Uh, and, you know, it, it opens more questions when you read it. So that's always the telling of a good storyteller. Next is Wade, Adams, Farmer, and Martin. And this is the Fantastic Four antithesis. 
Now, I know that Neil Adams is one of the old guard and he's, you know, he's, he's really well known for his art and he goes back quite a ways. Um, but I never quite bond with Neil Adams work and I'm not sure why that is. Uh, but this entire book, uh, is, is his style, uh, which it's, it's very much other people's jam. Uh, this it's, I will say as much as I love Mark Wade, it does feel kind of tropey that this whole storyline started with silver surfer falling to earth, injured and warning people that something bigger is coming. Cause <laughs> we've seen this before. We've seen this before, but, but, uh, it will play out in a way that is a bit different that we really haven't seen very often. So that was super interesting. Um, it's hit or miss. If you're a Fantastic Four fan, you're already on board with this and you're probably having a good time. Uh, if you're not, I would say don't jump in on this because it's kind of mid-arc. Go back two issues and get issue number one and then decide if you want to get into it. Next is The Unkindness of Ravens. Well, don't you just hate it when you uh, want to go to high school and your first day there you find out you're a dead ringer and look exactly like a girl who went missing? And that everyone in the school is mad at you because you look exactly like the girl who went missing. And then you get taken in by a group of misfits that all happen to be into witchcraft. Okay. It's, it's a weird story. It, it, it feels like they combined the craft with a murder mystery. And this is what came out. But... I'm not hating it. Like I sit down and read this and I'm like, mm. at times it feels a little archy and at other times it feels a little bit, well, dark Sabrina. Uh, it's pretty good so far. And it, it definitely, there is definitely a craft vibe. So if you read, if you not read, if you saw that movie in the nineties and you really didn't like that movie, then you will have a really good time with unkindness of Ravens. Cause I, and I think that that's what they're going for. So you should totally pick up this book if that's your jam. If you're anyone else, go back an issue and decide if you want to read it from there because uh, I think the first one does sort of set set the standard. Although we didn't see a lot of magic in the first one and you get to see a eh, decent amount of it in this one. And some of it's mind screw magic, which is always kind of funny. Forgive me. I didn't keep that throat going. Um, it sounds weird. <laughs> Next is Ewing, Bennett, Jose, Brabo, and Mounts. And yes, yes, we're talking about the best comic series that I've read in so many years and one that I'm loving intensely with just the best covers. And that is Immortal Hulk, the best horror comic on our shelves right now, Immortal Hulk. And we do know that the leader was in play and that the leader was at times controlling Bruce's father, who was being controlled by the one below all. So this is all types of twisted. And we do know that the leader wanted to break Bruce and wanted to break the Hulk and do it in a way that sort of broke his system because the Hulk is very much a disassociative identity disorder hero now. And he wanted to break him completely. And we get a lot of that in this issue. And it's drawn, it's illustrated in just the most twisted and messed up ways you can imagine. And we finally get to see the true form of the devil Hulk in this, which looks very A-bomb, so much so that the first time we opened the book, we confused him for A-bomb, I think, in the last issue. Um, so we finally get to see the true form of the devil Hulk, and it's, it's twisted. It's a good, good fight, a bunch of action. And that last panel, once again, I, I think... Every single time I turn to the last page in an Immortal Hulk issue, I screech. And I don't think it can be that much worse until the next issue where, again, I screech and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, yeah, it happens again. This issue is the perfect Halloween issue. It, it will hit you in the gut for sure. Uh, as, oh, God, it's so, 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 so good, though. Don't skip it. But um, I sound like a broken record when I talk about Immortal Hulk because everyone knows that, oh, it's stupid good right now. So really, if you aren't reading it yet, you need to jump in some time. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say this is the issue to jump in with because you might be confused because a lot of it is going on in Bruce's head. But it's pretty darn good. Uh, so check it out. 
Next is the amazing Spider-Man, Spencer Gleason and Delgado. And this is the wrap-up, sort of, for the Sins run and also the Kindred. And, you know, Sin Eater was just sort of the beginning and that the real fight that has been building for a long time is with the Kindred, who is this creepy sort of walking corpse uh, covered in centipedes that happens to be Norman Osborn's son. God, there is a sentence that I never would have ever guessed I would say on any timeline <laughs> in any world. Uh, yes, that's all what's been going on, and Spidey's got to handle it by dealing with Doctor Strange, but he's also kind of got to steal from Doctor Strange. So who do you think Spidey's going to tap to steal from Doctor Strange? Wow, what? It makes sense. She's done it before. And she's kind of his ex. So I will say as a Spidey fan, you won't be disappointed. As a Spidey Black Cat uh, and Doctor Strange fan, you will see this as calling back to several books that have happened over the past year. Uh, it was a pretty good showing. Chuckled a couple times. Uh, it was awesome. And I would say don't skip it. Don't skip it at all. Now is a book that is just absurdly fun in all the right ways. And that is Scotty Young, Humberto Ramos, and Edgar Delgado. And we're talking about Strange Academy. Now, if you can't tell from the cover, there's a bunch of doorways. Because there's a bunch of doorways that are portals in Strange Academy. And the game has been hatched. The game is called Doorway Tag. Yeah, <laughs> doorway tag where you try to run through different doorways to different realms and find other people to tag them while also trying to find other doorways and try not to die. That's literally what they say. And somebody else says, why is that not our school motto? <laughs> like, oh, God, it's so much fun. This is like if somebody like took the rules away from the Harry Potter uh, Hogwarts school and just said, hey, look, you're wizards and witches. Why don't you act like it? Uh, <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I'm having the best time with this run. Who knew that that I would love something like this from Scotty Young? I mean, Scotty Young is really great overall, but this is awesome. And I hope that, that Strange Academy continues for years to come. Uh, but, yeah, good showing, guys. I There are so many characters, and I always want to know more about them finish reading it. Um, next is Sean Lewis, Caitlin Yarsky, and this is Bliss. Now, Bliss, if you don't recall, uh, Bliss is a story that centers around a man who is being charged as committing just the worst crimes ever, a bunch of assassinations and a bunch of brutal things, but he did it so that he could fund his son's recovery because his son was very, very ill when he was younger and wasn't developing proper. So he did all of this to fund it. And in doing so, he used a drug called Bliss, which helps you forget whatever you've done for the last 24 hours. So he did all these wicked things and then sort of didn't let it affect him while he was sort of trying to save the son. So his son was arguing his defense. And that story changed because his son got abducted by a sorceress who was actually producing the, the Bliss. And so we get the wrap up of that where the dad is pissed and now he's got to go find the sorceress. That's what you get in this issue. So uh, Bliss is an awesome, awesome ride. And I know when I talk about it, I'm. it sounds like the strangest storyline ever. And it it is really weird. But the way they tell it is a different way. It's not a tropey way. Like it just... It feels like a really, really interesting story that they're just, they're sort of just giving you like bits and pieces and bits and pieces and letting you fall in love with the characters as they do. And, and that's what's happened. Uh, I really do love this guy's dad a lot. I mean, he's wicked and everything, but uh, he's sort of done what he had to, to, to help his son survive. And that's kind of beautiful. Uh, the, the art is really 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 good and i i think saying really good is just underselling it uh it's like fireworks on the fourth of july good it's just amazing i i am not bored with this art at all my god it's good i i, I can't wait to pick this up in uh in trade paperback form because i'm probably gonna just like set it out on a coffee table and like let people browse through it it's that good uh so don't skip it by any means don't skip that run it's great Next is Brandon Thomas, Lee Ferguson, Jose Villarubio, and Simon Boland. And we're talking about Sympathy for No Devils. 
And man, uh, this is a weird story. Uh, again, another weird story for the week. This one centers around, well, the the only human in a universe, well, a world full of monsters that has to like be kind of a detective and a cop at the same time. So he gets called back and out of retirement. And if that sounds like a weird premise, yeah, it's a weird premise. At times it felt like it was crawling out of the pages of BPRD. And it worked really well. I was super intrigued by the main character. Uh, I was interested in the monsters and I wanted to know a lot more. And there's a murder mystery at play. So uh, yeah, good showing guys. Um, as, as far as indies are concerned, I, 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 there's, there's, there's Aftershock comics has come out with some pretty good ones lately. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> super interesting. Want a little more, I would say if you need a little bit more monster stuff in your Halloween, maybe pick this up and give it a go. It's pretty good. Next, we're going to talk about Spawn 311, 311, which is Tom McFarlane and Carlo Bar Barbary. And it's, it, well, you know what's going on in the Spawn universe. It's been building towards a big fight, uh, and Spawn is sort of gathering his people. And meanwhile, the Spawn gunslinger is in play. Uh, but the cover is what really will sell it on everyone. Uh, and it, it pretty much has Al Simmons in the pose of Black Panther as a tribute. And it's very, very touching. It's a good-looking cover. Uh, no doubt, uh, probably the centerpiece of a lot of people's collections. So we've ordered extra copies. So if you need a few extra copies of this cover, come get it. We will have it. We also have the black and white one. I had one out. I don't know where it got off to, but it was around here. So if you want to get the black and white sketch one because you want to show off a little bit more, we have that one as well. Um, it's just a really, really striking piece that I feel like shouldn't be skipped. And Spawn has been heating up lately. The storyline's gotten really good, so you really shouldn't skip it. Next is from the world of Black Hammer, which I love. I love, but whenever we put these comics on the shelf, they don't sell very good, and I can't figure out why. Uh, Jeff Lemire and Tyler Crook. Granted, it's Jeff Lemire, and Jeff Lemire is tied to the Moon Knight mythos pretty deep. So, yeah, I like Jeff Lemire quite a bit. And this is Colonel Weird Cosmogog. Now, if you don't know Colonel Weird, he's basically sort of an Adam Strange's character in the Black Hammer universe. He pops in and out uh, through space and time. And he's always saying weird stuff because his time is just disjointed. And he's gone a little bit senile as well. And uh, you basically get a story from his perspective, which is awesome. I, I was totally... I, I was super into this story and felt really bad for him as a character because he gets thrown across time and is trying to like see patterns and bits and pieces. Meanwhile, his, his time is not linear. And, and when he pops up in other people's linear time, they're just like, come on guy, get it together. Like, what is your problem? And you know, one minute ago he was just a kid sort of trying to get a soda out of a case. And the next minute he's like fighting some big bad. So I really felt bad for him as a character. But my God, it was super cool and interesting. And by the time I hit the end of this one, this is one where I was like, oh, I need an issue too. I absolutely need an issue too. So um, if you haven't jumped in on Black Hammer, you should totally pick it up. I think we have a couple of the trades. But if not, I would say you could jump in on this one and pick it up and not be too confused for such a weird character. You probably wouldn't be too confused. He's, he's, he's really interesting. And the art's so good. So, uh, again, another book I would say don't skip this week. Don't skip that at all. Here is that Chadwick Boseman tribute from Spawn uh, that is the sketch cover. So, again, really good-looking cover. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, come check that out. And then, oh, this is a variant for X of Swords. I guess that was our last book, The Colonel Weird. But this is the X of Swords variant. We have one copy of this, but it features all the different swordsmen of Araco. Araco? I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, so yeah, don't skip that one either. It's pretty good. Um, and that's, that's our show for this week. Uh, we have a lot of books going out. I'm going to be hitting people up with, uh, with their email right now. Uh, we're still putting books away, so they will all be here to go tomorrow. And Rahelio, we will try to, do we have three Jokers cards? We do have three Jokers cards. I will try to get you one in your, in your box. Uh, and any word of second print for three Jokers. Joker's issue number two. Uh, not yet, but we will check. Um, you'd be better off just calling the store and asking us instead of like doing it on a live stream. It's kind of hard for me to talk then. Um, but 
We uh, That's our show for this week. Do we have anything else? Nothing else. We'll see you next week. Love you guys. Thank you. Like, follow, whatever I you want to box. You want to box? Well, come and see us, Don. We'll set you up with stuff. Do, do, do. Thanks, man. Just doing my best. I was getting hit with a lot of questions, though. I saw that. I was like, dude, did they not know what? <laughs>